Hello, my fellow lifeforms, and welcome back. I hope you're having a wonderful day so far. So I had the honor and privilege of sitting down and having a long conversation with SGD Sacred Geometry Decoded. SGD has a YouTube channel dedicated to his studies into the ancient world and esoteric symbolism, alchemy, sacred geometry, ancient architecture, mathematics, and a whole bunch of remarkable things that I highly recommend and I can't get enough of. He also dives into the world of lost ancient high technology where he explains the actual practical methods used to create the stonework we see from the ancient world using more basic primitive means. And when discussing such things, he can get a little spicy sometimes, but he does it in the most loving Australian way. This was a great conversation to have with SGD and I plan on having him on again eventually because there's just so much more we can talk about. But until then, I hope you guys enjoy the video. All right, everybody, I am here with SGD Sacred Geometry Decoded. I have been watching his work since the beginning of 2020 and he's got a plethora of knowledge remarkable amount of content and I've been trying to get him in here to have a conversation with him for a while now and we're finally sitting down to make it happen so SGD how's it going man you having a good day I'm fine man thanks for having me on awesome and, awesome uh, yeah um, yeah good to yeah we've had a few little chats before but yeah good to mm -hmm. put it down on record right yeah I've been really wanting to introduce you to my audience because your content has been really one of the main sources of research that I've you know, that I start with, I'll be like listening to your videos while at work or something. And you'll say something that like piques my interest that I then go further into, you know, once I get home on my computer, but the amount of information that you have collected and put together and like, it, it it's truly amazing. I, I, I think you're like up there with like one of those top content creators that is underappreciated on YouTube. You only got like 22, 25,000 subscribers and that needs to change because just with how you have organized your content, I, I absolutely love it and can only recommend everybody else to run over there and go check him out. SGD Sacred Geometry Decoded. I'll put a link for his channel down below. But there's some things I want to talk with you about. You have a great amount of information when it comes to esoteric symbolism and like these these symbols that show up within ancient architecture and art and geometry and so my question to you is is what is this information that's being encoded into this imagery like what 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 do you think it is where did it come from uh, well a great place to start would be probably stonemasons now uh only a sh in, in essence we had craft guilds i'm mm -hmm. not sure if people are familiar with them but basically they'll be origins of trade unions and well, a lot of uh, alchemy would be another aspect of that. So whether it's, you, you can even see like Freemason imagery has stonemason tools in there. Uh, alchemy imagery has a lot of, well, this um, very evocative imagery, which can be interpreted a lot of different ways. But the, the way that I approached it was more looking at the practical side and the trade skill side. Mm -hmm. uh, so especially like with um, alchemy, uh, Isaac Newton was a famous alchemist as well. You know, like not not, not as uh, popular among certain circles to mention that, but he engaged in alchemy a lot. But first, I should explain the way I approached alchemy was to think of it as an alchemist is essentially a chemist, mm -hmm. and it has a lot to do and has a lot to do with chemistry. So a lot of these that beautiful old artwork, when you start paying attention. Uh, a lot of the symbols are like literally iron, copper, lead, and then you'll see that even zodiac symbols, um, if read it from the alchem alchemical perspective, are different chemicals or, or compounds. Mm -hmm. And so, for instance, in in the ancient times, uh, the secret of making high quality metal, whether it was for cannons or or swords, this was like military tech. We, this would be like DARPA nowadays, right? You know, if you've yeah, so for instance, in the Bible, the Philistines had iron and the Israelites had bronze swords, and so they couldn't, comp was couldn't compete. superior, right. So, yeah, yeah. And so there's, you know, scientific knowledge. So alchemy would be more the chemical side, but if you think of it as uh, industrial scale chemistry, because it wasn't just the paintings tend to show like people tinkering around in their, in their shed in the background on their own, but they had 
large workshops, even in ancient Egypt, the mines were producing huge amounts per year. Right. Um, so they were, they were operating essentially on, on an industrial scale. They were trading with distant neighbours. And this, you know, this was the cornerstone of, of civilization and the economy um, of, you know, of those people. And this dates when back to like other, Mesopotamia, it, does it? You, you can trace it back really cleanly to uh, basically the Greek period. Okay. But then before yeah, before that, then the Greek speak of, for instance, Zoroaster is considered a very famous alchemist. He did uh, double distillation. Mm -hmm. And then we have people like there's a Cleopatra, the alchemist. She's said to have discovered the Philosopher's Stone. Mm -hmm. um, but even in so Greek Roman times, by then, these people were being spoken about in an almost legendary way. So that was like their, uh, you know, ancient um, ancestors. And it was a, it's a little bit misty, you know, before right. then. But in the artifacts that you find, whether it's Zagros Mountains, uh, Egypt, and the, you know, they were engaged in some level of uh, metallurgy, especially. And uh, one of my sort of favorite topics that I bring up a lot is that, for instance, Egyptian copper mm -hmm. is naturally high in arsenic, which right. makes a much stronger material. One thing I've been really interested in investigating for a while, um, and it was through looking at alchemy and metallurgy. So, uh, cannon casters, for instance, and, and they began with the uh, that skill was really developed out of the church bells because they, they all the people had the ability to right. cast, but they were using arsenic copper. So they had you know, arsenic in their copper and it, it makes the copper stronger, essentially makes it a bronze, a very strong bronze equal to uh, mild steel in strength. But ancient artifacts going back to you know the Middle East, Iran, um, Zagros Mountains and, and Egypt, they also had high levels of arsenic in there. So there's a arsenic called copper is defined as a copper that has less than 1% weight of arsenic and arsenic or bronze is defined as above that. And mm -hmm. the difference is that arsenic or bronze cannot occur by natural um, uh, mining because when you pull the, co <clears throat> pardon me, when you pull the copper out, there's all sorts of impurities in there. That's one of right. the, you know, to, to purify and there is a natural levels of arsenic egyptian and peruvian copper especially have naturally high arsenic but the egyptian copper has some um artifacts that are being analyzed have up to three percent copper which is that this must have been added so now the reason why yeah. the arsenic is significant yeah. on making the copper stronger is because you have a lot of content on showing how primitive primitive techniques were used to yes. carve very hard stone like granite. Yes. There's a lot of, yeah. there's a lot of content. And I used to be one of them because, you know, there was a lot of information out there that isn't exactly accurate on like this impossibility of carving granite in yeah. what I understand now to be very actual simple means. Like it's not that hard to make a box. Yes. And yeah. the, the, one of the lines that is told a lot is that copper cannot carve granite and it's it's this mis yeah. it's this misunderstanding that it's not the copper necessarily that is doing the carving most of the time um correct yes you know most of the time if they're actually chiseling at the granite they're either using another type of stone whether it be flint or basalt or you know pounding stone yes and the yeah. copper is more used as a guide for another medium like what was it aluminum oxide uh yes sand yes. Right. Yeah. So you would put like yeah. a aluminum oxide sand down in like a hole and the copper would just be the guide to <clears> grind <throat> that medium in the hole to carve away of the stone. And so exactly the, the, the simplest way would be to think of sandpaper. You know, right. You can. Yeah. The paper doesn't do the cutting. It's the sand. So right. it's copper or steel, because even steel is not going to really cut. Uh, granted as well, either they, you know, they'll either add an abrasive sand or have little diamond teeth attached to the steel. Mm -hmm. So they're just there to, to push um, ag ag against it. Right. You could, you could use string, you could use wood, um, but you just want something hard that's going to be able to put a bit of pressure um, against there. But it's sort of back on that sim 
uh, the ancients, uh, it's, it wouldn't be just for the stone working. If you've got a military that has this advantage, uh, you know, your, your copper your weapons. weapons are essentially mild steel. Yeah. yeah. You're going to, you're going to dominate mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, the, the people around you and stuff. And yeah, and it was through that sort of out, you know, studying the symbols in alchemy, evolved, but uh, one thing that I had sort of some discussions with, because a lot of people associate alchemy with mysticism. Yeah. So there's like the Jungian thinking as well that, uh, well, I, I can't say that there are not elements of that in there, mm -hmm. because when you look at, you know, you can see that they, different alchemists, uh, because there's the Renaissance European alchemists, there's uh, Arab um, alchemists, and you go back to Greek alchemists, and they all have those elements in there. But the one thing that joins them all is that they're all chemists. So right. they, whether they're working in medicine, working in metals, making glass and colouring glass, so it's, uh, everything that industrial chemist does now, there was the equivalent of those people back at the time. So I looked at it through that particular lens um, because, yeah, there was some alchemists, you could, you, you could see that they wouldn't say atheist, but they're much more practical. Mm -hmm. And then there are, are, are alchemists who were engaged in chemistry, but also they were very heavily into other aspects um, of you know, sort of spiritual, spiritual mystical yeah. sort of thinking. Right, yeah. right. So but, um, if I may, so like, within alchemy and you know masonry and all that stuff there's like this consistency of like symbolism that is that is so yes. intense and like they're and so deep and it's is it a way of is it this way of transporting knowledge and information in a way that somebody who doesn't know what it is could pass down that knowledge yes but i think it's also to preserve the knowledge so that if other people come across it they won't understand it entirely um, and i think this is like in modern times especially western christian ethic so there's that saying you know give a man a fish feed him for a day teach him how to fish feed him for a lifetime right this is very modern sort of western thinking but mm -hmm. the, the the way i think of it is that um you know sell a man a fish for, for a day you make a little bit of profit if you teach him how to fish You've got a lifetime competitor, right? And these old the old craft guilds were very, you know, you, you had to go through that apprentice system. You'd have to, you know, work for so many years underneath a master. Then you'd have to serve like an intermediate period before you were considered a full um, master of your trade, and only mm -hmm. then could you go and sort of work for yourself. And whether it was, you know, um, stonemasons, carpenters, virtually every trade, uh, arrow fletchers. So in the city of London, if anyone's interested, you can look up there um, in the city of London, not the metropolitan city, but the actual like, old part of London, all the craft guilds still have their headquarters in there. So there's like the apothecary guild, which is the old pharmacists, you know, mm -hmm. the origins of pharmacy. And you have bow fletchers, um, op, uh, what they call, I now forget their proper name, but the glass people who made eyeglasses. Mm -hmm. And there are all these formal guilds, which were like an early trade union. Um, another great example of that would be the stonemasons who built the great cathedrals. Right. Uh, they were very protective of their skills. They didn't want other people to know. Um, mm -hmm. Firstly, because they they wanted to protect the quality of their trade, but also you want to protect. Just like now, doctors and lawyers, you know, tend to have their, you know, union their group, and they want to restrict the numbers because there's mm -hmm. too many. Obviously, well. I'll lose out, but but those um, yeah cathedral builders they were able to compete with different cities who would you know, offer them better wages and conditions if they would were to come you know work in Chartres or Cologne or you know, come to my city to to do the work mm -hmm. and and you'll see a lot of these same with those symbols are a lot for instance the red stripe in the barber shop right that's like like a classic, you know, uh, also because a lot of those symbols were very important because prior to you know, literacy, this was how you would advertise. So you know, instead of having barbershop or, you know, hairdresser, you would have the red stripe. Mm -hmm. And that goes back to because the, the barber, or the, he was the only guy who really had really sharp knives and scissors. So now we think about shaving and heck, but 
back in that day, viral, even the term was barber surgeon. If you wanted to get a land spoiled or something, you went to that fellow because he was the one who had, had oh, the tools. Man. That's why that's why the red stripe is there. That's the blood, you know, or bloodletting. That was, you know, you'd go oh. to those barbers. So, um, now pawn brokers, they still have them around, but you'd see like three spheres, three balls hanging. That's what that's the old sign for. Uh, and it, like each craft guild or particular trade, yeah. Another example would be in in the churches. Uh, you know, you have the twelve stations of the cross, especially mm -hmm. in Catholic churches, because people were illiterate. So people illiterate in text, but back in the day, people were much more literate in symbology. Mm -hmm. And so that's there's, there's been a bit of a switch now. We're we're now very literate, but we're blind to the you know to to the symbols. And I didn't even think of that. Now. Yeah. That makes sense. Like that, so that could explain why symbolism is everywhere at that time. Is because people didn't know the written language; they they worked off of images. Yeah, yeah. Okay, and uh, yeah, it was now now we have a big written sign in neon, neon. But before there would be all these little subtle, um, make perfect sense to them. But for us, it, right, sort of, you know, we, it's just a foreign language to us now. Head. Yeah, that's that's great. There's there's Actually, another was, thing yeah. that that they were all into is sacred geometry they're all building all with the exact same methods of geometry yep. that goes back way who knows how far back the origin of sacred geometry actually yep. is and you know it, it's a question that is, is i know is difficult to answer but what is sacred geometry <laughs> Yeah, this is the tough one because it's sort of like asking, you know, what does God mean to you or what yeah. is religion? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so it comes down to, you know, what different, you can see on the internet, different people interpret it in, in different ways. And um, I don't want to get too, you know, pompous about it because, you know, but there's a sort of what I sort of see a bit of is a wishy washy way where, you know, essentially, you know, I might as well just speak openly, but where people just sort of, share gifts of a certain you know flower of life you know? right um but then i have to be fair if that's you know works for you then who am i to comment you know sort of on it but the way i approached it was that you remove the sacred and just begin with the geometry right you know, it'll be like with the with the alchemist all alchemists had different views you know there was a spiritual or sacred element running through them but they're all chemists. And so um, I sort of approached the sacred geometry in that way and said, well, all people who study it in different ways, one thing that they'll all return to is looking at architecture, whether it's mm -hmm. pyramids, uh, cathedrals, or, you know, that's sort of the one, just like with the alchemy and chemistry, this is the one aspect which everyone recognizes as, and, and sort of returns to intuitively. Mm -hmm. And that was sort of my approach to it. And I actually, didn't really care too much about the ancient history part of it when I began. I was looking at modern buildings, mm -hmm. mainly because there's this, there's documentation. You can get the biography of the architects, and it's not veiled in any sort of you know missing gaps in the historical record. It's quite uh, you know you know obvious. And uh, the thing that really sparked my interest was a great series called Secrets in Plain Sight by Scott Onstott, mm -hmm. which compiled so much different you know very out there stuff i would say as well but also the more you know meat on the bone stuff great suit because he goes across the whole um and that got me interested because i'd always thought living in australia you know you know we're this new country you know there's nothing you know sort of happening here mm -hmm. but then sort of got my eyes open to uh for instance washington dc mm -hmm. you know and you can see there's uh, even the more skeptical people sort of recognize you know you know that there is there's a structure and organization just, yeah. to it. Yeah. Yeah. And you can even like trace the groups, especially Freemasons. You could, you know, I don't want to, because when you say Freemasons, it creates people's heads people explode. I know. About so they yeah. just don't know about um, it is all. Yeah. yeah. And so it was, but then I realized, oh, wow, you know, this is in a, I looked at our capital city and then I realized that our capital city has got not just the same design elements, but the legal structure. Mm -hmm. Like Washington DC is not a state. It's mm -hmm. essentially, you know, it's it's separate jurisdiction. Mm -hmm. Well, our capital city, Canberra,
for a, is in the ACT, the Australian Capital Territory, which is again not a state. It's got a very unique separate um, jurisdiction and just yeah, the legal framework and then the architecture, the way that the streets are lined up and all these other connections. And I thought, oh, wow, you know, just have this, Australia is interesting. We're not. You're not alone. Separate. You're not unique. Yeah. <laughs> and then uh, that, I come across another Aussie guy and, and just down the road from where I live, a few kilometres. So I'm in Western suburbs of Sydney, you know, like the, you know, the, the, the poor area, you know, like, you mm -hmm. know, it's like, oh, we've got nothing here, there's nothing. Then he did a video just walking through Liverpool, sort of, which is the major town, sort of satellite city where I'm closest to. And he's just pointing his stuff out. And then I'm really like, wow, you know, like this, mm -hmm. it is here and it is around and you can see it. And then I sort of traced the history of it and went back to the original founding of the town and found that this one particular um, governor earlier in Australia, he set up the streets and grid plans and the street widths and the block widths and, and so those sacred numbers like 108, 864, yeah. Yeah, he's built those in there and then you see, well, yeah, he was a, you know, not just a Freemason, but they, even his biography, he's a conscientious Freemason hmm. and, he, and his wife was um, very into, much into architecture and, and design as well and so they, they set up so I tended to think pyramids and, you know, you've got to have a Stonehenge. Mm -hmm. But in the USA and Canada, they have it's essentially the same where you have the one chain, the width of the street, 66 feet. Mm -hmm. And these were echoed around. But, yeah, it's the house. You're, even if you sort of think you're in a you know, boring area, your street plan, your block width, there's a good chance that, you know, this is – you can trace this back to this very interesting period of history where, uh, especially in America, like, and then the City Beautiful movement was another mm -hmm. um, in the early 1900s, late 1800s. There was a resurgence of this, for instance, a redesign of Chicago or San Francisco after the fire, mm -hmm. where you can see these a very small influential group of architects, but they were all operating with the same proportions and the same numbers. Right. And, and so it was by studying this in local here and then, okay, well, when went back, okay, in Paris. Right. You know, or in London, you can find it. And then, okay, you just keep going back in time and you just keep yeah. finding it every time, everywhere. And then yeah. you finally hit Egypt and it's just, yeah. is that where basically your, not, your information when it comes to like understanding the uh, layout of Giza and, you know, the the geometry of the pyramids really took off? Uh, yes, but after, but mainly because up to back, well, back to Roman times, there's great books written about it, um, you know, and it's not... Uh, Let me pause you for a second. Not, I had a little window pop okay. up. We got 10 minutes on this yeah. meeting right now. Cool. And I had a little window pop up, of course, right in the middle of the screen where yeah. I'm recording. So it's like, ah. Oh. So mm -hmm. let me let me ask you that question again because I want to yeah. I want to rephrase that if I if I could so. Um, so you're finding these numbers and ratios showing up in all of this modern architecture, and you just keep you know following the rabbit hole, and it leads you t to you know some of the most ancient architecture on on the planet, like in Egypt. Yeah. We find it in the Great Pyramids and Heliopolis and the whole Giza Plateau. We find these ratios and numbers, and so. Is that where your study of like Egypt and the pyramids and Giza in general really took off? Yes, and I, I went heavily into there because back to the Greco-Roman period, there's a lot of good texts when, and they're written in a very concise way that we can translate very mm -hmm. um, easily. You know, they just pulleys and levers and chem, you know the, the words that we use very commonly to sign uh, Latin and. And, and Greek is the basis of our scientific languages and even still biology right. and all that. Right. And, but I went heavy into uh, Egypt because, yeah, I was trying to, there are, there are obvious geometric connections and some people say, well, it's just, just a coincidence. Right. But by reading the Roman text, they make no secret that they say, we got this from, from Egypt. the Egyptians. Right. Yeah. And so it was, yeah, it, I was looking, since there's not a written record, so I was basically, I just, okay, I'm just going to go north to south, 
I'm going to get all the data that I can. Mm -hmm. And so, and so for those who say it's coincidence, it's okay. Look, here's a list of all of everything that's happening, you know, the, the ratios of the pyramids and which sort of match that you'll find in these later parts. And then it will be, well, it's sort of really now up to you to tell me what coincidence is. Right. You know, I, I sort of want a metric of, you know, um, how do you determine what's in a any coincidence? Other, <laughs> yeah. And just as I went further and further, like it, it is, it, it's try, I want you to provide a few examples where it's not happening. Mm -hmm. it sort of would be my response, to, you know, to there. It's very clear that they were using these geometric and the very, very simple ones and not complex. It's, you know, I know, two to three, three to four, yeah. seven to 11. It's very sort of basic um, stuff. Align it to the equinox, align it to the solstice. Mm -hmm. So in itself, it's not requiring high levels of, you know, of, um, you know, computer, you know, supercomputer mathematics in itself. It's, and it's just very, it's evident that, it, that it's there. It's just, I think if people have a look at it, it's, it's, it, it screams at you once you actually like accept that it, it could be there like once you actually start to look yeah. for it it just starts to scream at you and it, once you once you've studied it enough especially within just egypt alone it's just kind of like something else is going on in this story. there's no way that the whole yeah. the only reason for this for this pyramid's existence is just to bury a guy like there just with how much yeah. accidents mathematically show up in that structure it just, it's beyond the realm of an accident and coincidence in my book it's just whoever built that structure knew way more about this planet than what we give the current egyptians credit for yeah. well for instance in the Rome block like, uh, vitruvius and the architecture the architecture i always get the pronunciation the 10 books of architecture by vitruvius mm -hmm. he talks about this very clearly matter of factly it's not you know sort of veiled in any you know mystery or whatever but you know the pro uh, the proportions of a temple should meet certain um uh, the temple you know, that it should be just like a well proportioned man that's that's how the temple should be these should be the basic ratios in in your temple and that it's important for acoustics as well mm -hmm. this is exactly the same principle in cathedral design where you see you know these repeated, you know, height to length to width proportions and um, trying to get the best acoustics in there. Mm -hmm. And I think, well, that same philosophy, you know, well, it's again, to me, it's clear that this was, you know, in their, all of their temple, uh, like Luxor and Karnak or the pyramids as well. And uh, especially with something like a pyramid where it's very, you know, it's not complex, you know, it's mm -hmm. basically four triangle, yeah. Architects still now, well, the basic proportions and measurements of your building is still the basis of architecture. So you, if you watch any home design show, they're going to come in, well, this room is it's too low or it's too wide or it's too narrow. Mm -hmm. so this is still very you know, intuitive for people to you know, want a, a living space or a house that looks and feels right. Mm -hmm. And so I think that, that at the very least, that you know, when they design the pyramid, it's well not just some guys that's going to randomly say, well, just put it this high. Yeah, we'll make it this way. Thought went into this, the yeah, logistics yeah. alone of moving it. Right. Um, but then it comes to the, the depth of the explanation you want to go into. And there's a great channel, Norm Wilderberger. He's a mathematician. He's an American fella, but he's uh, here in the University of New South Wales here in Sydney. Uh, he did a great, um, he's right into this you know, type of thing as well, but... What was his yeah, name? The, Norm Weldenberger? Norm Wild, Wilderberger. Um, Wilderberger. I'll put, I'll, yeah, I'll send the links. I'll okay, yeah. You can, you get his channel here. He talks about Pythagorean tuning. and mm. uh, But an important revelation for, for me was, and this was a really, uh, just to sort of get me, knock me da back down to a bit more common sense. And he just described, for instance, in, in Babylon and in Egypt, when I think of a triangle, I think of, you know, so you've got a triangle, I sort of think, define it by the angle and the hypotenuse. So mm -hmm. I think of it, okay, that's, um, and it's very much the Pythag, you know, uh, Western way that we sort of still do it now. But he explained how for the Egyptians and especially for the Babylonians, but they thought of a triangle as half of a rectangle. 
Mm -hmm. So in think, you know, so yeah, it's a free sided object, but to properly understand it, you're really just sort of cutting a rectangle mm -hmm. across, you know, from corner to corner. So when they when they defined a triangle, it was like uh, rise, you know, or the height over the run, mm. rather than thinking of the hypotenuse, you see the angle going across. And this is how they did their land survey. And it's not just sort of a hypothesis. He, he looks at the, the clay tablets and the land survey documents, which is matching Egypt, you know, sort of very closely in a lot of ways. Unfortunately, in Egypt, because they wrote in papyrus, not much survived, mm -hmm. but because they wrote in clay tablets in Babylon, there's a lot, lot of, there's a lot of those. So, yeah, <laughs> yeah. And their mathematical, astronomical, astronomical knowledge is, is great. And we've got the documents there. Right. Um, but they didn't have access to stone. So they tended to build in mud brick. Mm -hmm. So their monuments don't survive. But in Egypt, the documents don't survive, but their monuments do. Right. So there is a little bit of a leap, but you, they were in contact. And so I sort of, well, at least in, I don't think it's too big of a jump. If I were doing this quality math in the Twin Rivers and the Tigris Euphrates, they were in contact with the, you know, in trade contact, you know, they literally, yeah. And Absolutely. So it's not a big leap to think that, you know, Egyptian maths is a little bit more advanced than what we can see in the Egyptian papyri, which do survive. Oh, I do. I agree it's, with that. I mean, yeah. just the Great Pyramid alone proves that their mathematical knowledge was beyond what we give them credit for. But the academics I, will tell you that's yeah. just a big old coincidence and an accident. You know, they didn't, they didn't mean to do that. Yes, they just accidentally yeah. put that rock there yeah. just like that. <clears throat> Well, that's sort of, yeah, that sort of seems to be the general opinion, but then, uh, you know, over the years, I, there are, you know, academics out there who have got much more views or orientated towards the way I do. Uh, post you the link, it's uh, J, J. Caprif, if you look up the Symmetry Festival 2016. Okay. Uh, that's a great, great lecture there. And he's, uh, especially in that one, because he's comparing Indian and Greek architecture, and that the various, again, very simple proportions, but they encode a lot of uh, lunar and solar cycles, and you know, the different, uh, for instance, the, uh, now the name escapes me, the, the cycle which leads to the uh, uh, eclipses, and um, and uh, it, that in its own would be really worth looking into, but mm -hmm. this is a uh, one of the things that really got sort of me interested in there because my main interest in uh, sacred geometry, again, I was trying, I was just before I'd seen that uh, secrets in plain sight, you know, just by chance I'd pulled out my compass and straight edge, which, you know, I hadn't hmm. had it open since, you know, high school. And so I was helping this guy out just to um, get him through his exams and, so this was fresh in my mind and I'd watched some, uh, I've always sort of been interested in, you know, I think everyone is the path and on the pyramids. They're just mm -hmm. you know, universal. They, they attract people's imagination and attention. And pr previous to that, I'd seen, a, uh, it's, again, it's a great documentary for a lot of reasons, but the secrets of the path of the path and on it's called. Mm -hmm. And there's a uh, Mark Wilson Jones. He's a um, professor, uh, professor of ar uh, architectural history. And he showed these metrological uh, reliefs. So it's, it, it's basically a picture of Vitruvian man, but carved in stone, mm -hmm. and where it's got multiple sets of ancient measurements sort of coming together. Mm -hmm. And so, so that was sort of the way that I looked at it because I, I'm fascinated by weights and measure. In that, because you can weigh it and measure it. So it's not uh, interpret. I, I don't want to. I personally get frustrated with the interpretation. Not not because of other people, but I can interpret something five different ways in five right. different minutes, you know, mm -hmm. depending on my mood at mood at the time. And I sort of want something I can chew, you know, grab onto. You mm -hmm. know? Um, and I, and I especially want to, for those who might be you know, sort of skeptical, here is data that you can rely on. And that's so called the Salamis really, you know, stone. Is that what yeah, you're referring the Salamis to? stone. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's yeah, there's one of them, and then there's a few others uh, as well. But I started with that one because that's got the direct tie on it mm -hmm. and um, same sort of foot in there. Mm -hmm. And then when you apply these ratios to ancient architecture, which you can 
uh, for instance, the Parthenon, where you can look, literally see it and the connections there, that even in modern architecture, that using those uh, measurements and you get all of the beautiful numbers appearing again. And it's right. And it goes back to, again, these very simple proportions will automatically lead you to all these, you know, other connections. Mm -hmm. um, but then that, the trouble with that is, well, you can design, so if I design something at 108 feet, because I'm replicating an older temple and mm -hmm. I just, I, I want to use it. I don't need to know that all of this, you know, other coincidence or, 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 or knowledge is, is built into that. Right. So, so that's, um, was the, I think that's, that's the main issue for me and, and for, and it's also the flaw in the system mm -hmm. because it's, uh, the pyramid would be one great example because you've got a seven to 11 proportion, which is sort of half pie. I, I prefer to look at the pyramid from the corner because yeah. it's not a triangle, it's a pyramid. And so mm -hmm. you can, you know, a pyramid you can see to, if you do it that way, then you get 22 over seven, which is as, as a good as an approximate of pie as what, um, unless you're doing space age, you know, a really sophisticated right. uh, engineering, 22 over sevens are um, going to work for you. The possibility is that they did um, incorporate that pi ratio on purpose. Mm -hmm. That's you know, I, I, personally, I think that they that they did. Well, it and, shows up multiple times yeah. within the structure, doesn't it? Yeah, it's yes, not just that's once. Right. And yeah, that's right. Yeah, and that's on the yeah. It's so many like again in all those videos. Like you know, it's, yeah. it's everywhere. You but find it in the king's other, chamber. Yeah. You find it in like the slope angle to the base. I mean, I, yeah, I, I forget yeah. how many times it actually shows up, but it's at least three times yeah. as far as I can remember in your videos. Uh, I, even, yeah, even even in the subterranean chamber, when you enter the, you know, the unfinished chamber, mm -hmm. subterranean chamber, there's a, well, that's got it in there as well. The little doorway, um, the entrance? Yeah, there's just a little, yeah, you know, just a yeah, yeah. rectangular opening to get in there. But the measurements, so it's not the actual proportion, you know, the, the measurements of it, uh, or even scaled to the pyramid itself. Right. So um, if, yeah, so the number of cubits, if you multiply that by the number of, well, it, yeah, um, you know, there's a, uh, forget the exact saying, if, you know, if soldiers say, you know, once is an accident, if there's one shot, it's an accident, mm -hmm. two shots, be cautious. If there's three shots, it's an, an enemy action. Right. So, yeah. And, and then you look, well, you go next door and then, or, uh, other pyramids as well and you see that these ratios are just repeated all, all the time so mm -hmm. it's almost like cookie cutter yeah so, uh, yeah uh, the main one that's copied is actually Caffrey's pyramid the one in the middle which mm -hmm. is that two to three mm -hmm. sort of ratio if you look at the like down towards Abyss here and those other pyramids well, they're all um of that two to three ratio mm -hmm. but they also all have a 150 meter 150 cubit base and 100 cubits high mm -hmm. but then when you convert yeah it just goes it depends on how far you want to go because i think that those ancient units of are connected mm -hmm. and, um and and uh, so things like the meter um strictly true the meter was formed you know the meter didn't wasn't an official measurement until the french you know defined supposedly it in yes <laughs> But um, in in cathedrals going back to the 1300s, they were using uh, even in, it was a, a German measurements now obsolete. Mm -hmm. Their foot was 333 millimeters, so this yard was a meter. Um, right. You know. So yeah. <clears throat> um, before the Hellenistic period, there's even in the Athenian Charter on weights and measurements, they refer to this older. Um, yard that was being used that yard is somewhere between 900 and 99 millimeters and you know 1002 or 1001 millimeter mm -hmm. so within that you know that one tenth of one percent margin of error it is a meter um, so okay the, the meter officially yes the french defined it but people unit were using measurements which are equivalent to a meter going back you know because the meter is a universal yeah. constant 
it's not like it's just one random measurement that somebody came up with. Not only is it the one second pendulum, but it's also, you know, the measurement of the planet itself. And, you know, there's more than one way to find a meter. So the idea that these people just are just making up measurements is, is kind of ludicrous because it's like you're not going to have a society that is able to function unless you all can agree that this is this length and it's not my yes. opinion that it's this length, right? Yes, yeah. And that's what I think that... So what was the origin of civilization? Uh, you couldn't have had something happen if there wasn't, a, a, at least in my opinion, a functioning trade network, which, right. as you said, relies on standards of measurement. Mm -hmm. One thing that really piqued my interest was that in Mahenjadaro, uh, you know, same time as the Old Kingdom, mm -hmm. they were both using the same... Or, you know, either independently or, or but they for instance 27.3 grams or 13 point and these are weights half of that or, little, yeah. little like weights yes. that they had yeah. right and uh, the egyptians these were, were using both the same used, yeah. to measure gold is it, what was it called yes so yeah the deben or the, the deben, deben. Or the deben. Yeah, yeah yeah yes and so you had a copper deben of 27.3 grams mm -hmm. and a gold that uh, Devon of 13.6 grams. And that number itself, 27.3, is also significant. That's not just a random a random number. Well, yes, and that's the one that you'll... When I sort of cottoned on to it, it was, oh, wow, like, I wanted... Because I was into that, you know, Pythagorean tuning and harmonics, I wanted to get 27, because mm -hmm. 27 is 54, and then 108, and 216, mm -hmm. you know, right. et cetera. But I kept I kept getting twenty seven point three, and this was, mm. and I was trying it every which way to try and shoehorn it, you know, to try and make it fit. But then mm. I re no, you know, that the, this is what it is, you know. Um, yeah. Yeah, but then I realised uh, now twenty seven point three, at least as a mnemonic, um, as a way to remember things, is one of the best numbers you'll probably ever want to have in in terms of remembering, especially sort of sun, earth, and moon right. relationships and. And so, you know, the moon is 27.3% the size of the Earth. There you go. Yeah, yeah. And, and so, like, the, and the so like moon these, orbits, yeah. These numbers seem to, like, always come back to the solar system somehow. Like, the sun and the Earth yes. and the moon. Like, and, and how is the ancient world... How did the ancient world know these ratios? I mean, they didn't have telescopes, supposedly. Yeah. So some of them... Well, we... Now, for, um, We've now created that sort of basically a 30 day month, you know, like we've got, you know, 30 days, 20, uh, 31 days. Yeah. Uh, yeah. There are really two months to think of. So we have the full moon, which mm -hmm. you know, roughly, you know, we have roughly 12 full moons per year. Mm -hmm. uh, but even going back to Babylonians, they were able to work out exactly or to within decimal points that the, the true lunar month, would be 29.53 days, so mm -hmm. 29 and a half days. And they worked that out, you know, quite, so that's sort of a difficult observation to make. You just sort of do repeated, you know, over a couple of years or, you know, over generations and you, you whittle it down and they got it pretty well. Mm -hmm. um, but then there's, that's the synodic month, as it's called. Uh, mm -hmm. Then there's another month, uh, the sidereal, and that's 27.3 days. So, Synodic, the full moon is really, you could think it's it's a relationship of sun, earth, and moon. So mm. if you use the sun as your fixed point, it takes 29.53 days for the moon to orbit the earth and come back at, at that point. Mm -hmm. So, um, But uh, if you use the star as your fixed point, because during that time, the earth's going to be moving. Mm -hmm. So a sidereal month is a little bit shorter because of a, you know the movement of the earth that's 27.3 days mm -hmm. and that 28 you could just have a 28th day um now in in india they tended to often go for the 28 day month uh we sort of now stuck on the 30 day sort of um month as well but, but again not a difficult um Calculation. Uh, calculation to make yeah yeah, yeah. so that uh, and that's i'm always trying to find the 
you know, Occam's rate, I'm trying to find this, you know, but the simplest sort of solution, um, mm -hmm. you know, to, so those, then, but if, I think, you know, you can be too rational in a way, I mean, right. like I shouldn't say that, you, know, you should be, but you can, um, just like you can uh, go looking, for, you, know, you want to find something so much that you really, you know, you look for it too hard. Oh, yeah. You can also, I, I, I think you can find yourself um, determined not to find something so much that you, you know, you can train right. yourself not to look for things. Yeah. Right. And so that, like, people, and it's very true, there's that uh, pair of dealing where people see patterns, you know, where, because they want to see them essentially. Right. right. Now I forget the, I forget the name of, there's another word, which is the opposite of that, where you can also, there's a failure to see patterns, you know, mm -hmm. that, that's also a, con, a condition too. And, right. Um, right. Yeah. But with that, with that 27.3, I, it's just a fact, you know, um, and that, and that, that's an observation that yeah. that makes sense that like the ancient world could have made because you don't need a, like any kind of special yeah. equipment to just observe the orientation of the moon. But when it comes yeah. to like determining the size and shape of the planet itself, that's a level yeah. of complication that we're told the ancient world didn't have. And I'm I'm specifically referring to the Great Pyramid, containing yeah. a remarkable level of accuracy the polar diameter of the earth along with this equatorial circumference. And, yes. you know, how, like, and, you know, most people are, you know, they just know it as a tomb to bury a guy, but I don't mm. feel like that's something you would encode into a structure just to bury somebody. And the question is how, like, if the thing is, if the ancient, if the old kingdom Egyptians built that structure and it is true that the, pyramid is a scale model of the planet then they knew way more about this earth than what we give the old kingdom egyptians credit for and if yes. they didn't if if you know their knowledge what we understand their knowledge to be is accurate then that information could have only have come from before well uh I'll just jump forward a bit to to the roman period okay uh, and from surviving text, they used the eclipse and they were able to work out the relative size and distance of the sun and the moon. Now, they did get it wrong, especially with the distance of the sun. Yeah. But their, me their method was infallible. Mm. So if they had you know, done more observations and corrected it, they would have eventually narrowed it down. And also with a little bit of you know, sticks and strings and shadows and, and logic, this is the most important you know, tool mm -hmm. that we sort of humans have they were able to deduce certain things. So once they knew the size of the earth, then they were able to get the size of the sun and the moon, or at least a method for it, the surviving text, um, that, that is, and also the distances. Uh, it was fascinating when I found, you know, um, learned about that, because I think, and I've even read, there's a bit of a, a bias amongst, especially developed, you know, probably around about the you know, 1800 period. If you go a bit before then, the idea that the Egyptians were more, advanced mathematically and, and astronomically wasn't so controversial right um but i think there's a bite so if you say the greeks did it everyone just accepts it oh, right yeah, you know, yeah yeah all right but if you well if the babylonians oh then it's uh well you know you're into a fairy area sort mm -hmm. of type of thing there but again the, the romans and the greeks them, you know, say they went to Heliopolis or you know, later Alexandria to get their not you know their their training or to Chaldea as they call it Babylon mm -hmm. to um to get their knowledge. So I, I, admittedly we don't have you know a beautiful written record like we do in the case of Romans or Greeks, right. but the Romans they weren't operating. You know, they weren't <clears throat> genetically superior or something you know, to these earlier civilizations which you know they sort of developed from. They and were so learning I, from them. Yeah. And, that, yeah. and, that, and that's the case, you know, throughout yeah. Yeah. civilization. It's like the, the, the current civilization you're studying is always learning from the previous one. Yes. Yeah. And so look, my, I honestly can't say that there's a solid body of evidence, um, circum, even circumstantial, to say that, the, for instance, the Egyptians knew the size of the earth. But I don't think it's a big leap to go from, well, we do know that Eratosthenes, for instance, he, he's famous for measuring the polar circumference of the mm -hmm. earth. He was the chief library 
Liberian of Alexandria. He went to the well of Cyane and, and took right. the measurement um, from the obelisk in Alexandria. My personal thought of that is that with access to the library, he was recreated in an older experiment. Yeah. Which, you know, doesn't necessarily have to be old, but so I, I think that's at least a possibility. Um, mm -hmm. you know, like, um, and again, it's not a very complicated uh, experiment to do. It just requires those few steps of logic and you know, some basic sort of maths as well. Right. But then if you do look at the old kingdom measurements, they were using long, really long measurements. To, you know, they were measuring big distances um, of, of land and uh, so I, 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 I personally lean, I strongly believe I do, but I have to admit there's not a, you know, smoking gun document, you know, to do it. But the leap from, if, yeah, if the Romans and Greeks could do it, I, uh, you know, I don't, you know, at least to accept the possibility that the Egyptians could, because they're essentially working with the same, you know, technology. Mm -hmm. And then, yes, we don't have these excellent mathematical, we do have good papyri with mathematical data on it. But at the same time, you look at the Babylonians, you know, so they were contemporaries, they were in contact, they were in trade, and they had reached this level. And their, astro you know, their astronomy, we've got the clay tablets, it's all you know, written down very clearly. Mm -hmm. So I think just to, just to give them this little bit of elasticity, I mean, a, a little bit of, well, it's not, it's not a giant leap, you know, but they did these things. And, and when you look at the number of times that it's, it's for instance, the Great Pyramid in those, proportions mm -hmm. um you know related to the size of the earth yeah i think that they did um my personal you know opinion of that because all all the elements were there um, mm -hmm. again, not a smoking gun document but we had it's not a giant leap of faith to get you know from right. here to there and then i think going back to like the alchemy and well chemistry in the mining they were very very sophisticated people they were trading long distances mm -hmm. international trade um you know they weren't just on little dinky boats up and down the Nile. They were you know, very well organised, excellent bureaucracy, even just like the proofs in the, you know, the size of the country. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's my... You know, I try to be... Yeah, it's hard. It, it is a... You know, I want to say a matter. It's circumstantial, but it's not... Uh, outrageously giant leaps to get right. you know get, to get from from one to another. I agree. But then I you can agree. go into the yeah. Then you can go into the depth of it, whether you know, exactly how far did it go. Then I think it's sort of it is a rabbit hole. Mm -hmm. But sort of going back to that pyramid and those pi proportions. You now, if you build a pyramid to seven to eleven, uh, even if you just know the pi proport, you know, uh, of height to base. Out of that, you're going to get so many other mathematical constants emerging. Mm -hmm. Whether they knew about all of them, I don't think is, well, maybe they did, but I think actually the really important question is this geometry is so, um, it delivers so much information that it's not even a matter of whether the ancients knew it or not. It's, well, I think, at least for mathematicians, it would be exciting, exciting to look at how so-called unconnected constants might actually be connected in a, in a very lovely way in right this, in this very simple geometry um so so i guess the of, next yeah, question would be is, one of, the next question i guess would be is like wh why would you even encode that kind of information in a giant pyramid like why what's the point very much like the cathedrals or like with roman temples um that a cathedral, St. Mary's Cathedral in Sydney, mm -hmm. it has got a crypt in there. There are bodies buried in there, mm -hmm. but it is not, not a tomb. Mm -hmm. you know, it, it, it has multiple purposes. Uh, there was a great lecture I heard. To, so the origin of the word workship, uh, sorry, worship, um, now I, I just sort of heard this, I didn't, but that, that emerged from workshop and that the old cathedrals were workshops and work centres and they definitely were the original universities, you know, where people mm -hmm. would come to study and especially to learn the seven uh, liberal arts. And so, at the, yeah, but the, I like the term that it's a textbook in stone. So, right. Even let's work with the assumption that it's a two. Let's just begin with that. And um, mm -hmm. if you're the designer and, and 
rock star architects still do this today. You know, he's passed on I.M. Pei, who was a you know, very famous um, architect. Eventually, he got, he got you know, um, the interviewer pulled it out of him, but he had, I.M. Pei said, yeah, one of the most important things I learned was the golden section mm. and that he, you know, put this into his buildings. And then he was a guy I studied for a while, looked at all his buildings, and, yeah, he's got all those harmonic numbers in there as well. Uh, Norman Foster is another one, and you see him, he's just everywhere. Whenever there's a big development, you know, really important one, you know, his company or he is attached and his buildings are always running these same measurements and numbers that are um, coming back. So proportion and measurement is this essential language in architecture. Uh, right. So building the pyramid, uh, at the very least that, you know, he's, um, that the architect can have a little smile on his face because Everyone's looking at it, but he's going, but I know the secret. You know? Right. Look, there's actually all that, there's all these other levels going on. And that still happens in you know, modern buildings today. Um, uh, especially like, you know, uh, grotesques, you know, they're not like gargoyles, uh, the things that hang off and, and pour the water away for that's like, but then you have all those other faces and stuff uh, mm-hmm. that are usually carved into those, you know, nice old buildings. They're t- technically they're grotesques, they're called, but there's still this tradition where um, people carve all sorts of, oh, it's a long story, yeah, but there's all this symbology and language that's going on in buildings that we're not really appreciating because it's the, the craft guild, you know, those people, you know, they're putting their, their signature onto, you know, onto something to give it a little bit more depth of meaning or just like this is our little sort of secret that's going mm-hmm. on. And, yeah, sort of my mind sort of wandering now off the good. original. Topic, um, yeah. but yeah i'll say that the pyramid that at the very least the architect you know all, all those in the know will appreciate that there's this these levels going on in, an underlying meaning of yeah. the whole yeah. the whole yeah. image right right so i'm gonna i'm gonna but bring it back cathedral sorry go ahead sorry and, yeah, cathedrals these are all sacred buildings as well so right. same with the indian temples yeah there's a great uh the designers, for instance, in Indian temples will still talk about the, um, uh, the Shastra, I forget the exact name of this ancient practice, where they put astronomical knowledge. And if you're going to build a beautiful building, especially something that's sacred, you're not just going to do it random. You know, you're going to right. really put a lot of meaning into it and go, you know, and really try and make it the, the perfect, you know, building as, as close as you can. And that would include. Well, every you know, yeah, every little thing that you can um, to go into it, especially um, astronomical alignments and things yeah. like that, and that's you know, still ha- have it have it now. reflect yeah. the 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 world and you know the greatness of the universe. Yeah. You know the saying yeah. I forget who's who it's from, but it's like you know, as above, so below. It's like you know yeah. we're trying to replicate creation in our architecture, and so yeah. yeah. And, you know, it, it leads you down the, another rabbit hole of like, well, you know, if these numbers keep showing up in architecture and we keep finding them within nature itself, I mean, that's where geometry originates from, really. Like, th- these basic proportions were there before humans even existed, you know, within geometry. Exactly, yeah. And yeah. so, you know, we didn't invent it, we discovered it. And so it, you know, kind of leads you down this rabbit hole of, well, you know, was that just happenstance? Did that just accidentally work out that way? Or was there an architect to existence? You know, it leads you down that, you know, religious, spiritual thought process. Yes. And, you know, you get some people that are like, oh, well, it's all just random chaos. And it's like, well, then you just haven't studied it yet. Because it's just, just to think it's just an, all an accident. The way the solar system works with all these ratios that are then showing up in our ancient architecture. It just seems a little bit beyond act like a coincidence in, in, in my yeah. book with that. But, uh, you know, well, I, so Pi, Pi would be a great example of, of that. So it's a fixed ratio. You know, um, I'm not a religious person, but I, I like to look at it as what someone, you know, of that persuasion would, would do. And hmm. for, for me, okay, well, yeah, it's, it's just a proportion of diameter to circumference, but mm-hmm. this can be a, pro- well, this is, you know, um, I don't like to, but a law of 
Mm-hmm. God, God has created, God has decided this. You can't mess with it. You know, this mm-hmm. is you know, sort of yeah, a, a law of nature. Yeah. So those people who, who are of that persuasion, what could be more sacred than pi? Right. Anyway, this is, yeah. Or the, or the golden ratio. ratios. Yeah, the, yeah. the vesica. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. So I, I, again, I'm not, you know, uh, re- religious or you know, sort of spiritual in any particular way, but I, I could see how these architects or these ancient traditions would see view these things as, you know, divine. It's a mathematical constant. Yeah. Yeah. But what is what is more divine than a mathematical constant? Right. It's, it's unchanging. You, there's a stupid little window came up yep. again in my screen. We got ten minutes. Yeah. All right. Well, I guess I guess we might as well wrap it up a little bit. So, um, so I guess my thought process, you know, c- coming a little bit back to the beginning is like, what is sacred geometry? You know, like you said, it, it can be different for the, for an individual, you know, it depends on how much you've researched and what you've researched dictates what you believe sacred geometry to be. From my understanding and my research, what it seems to be is that it's the artificial representation of the geometrical structure of existence itself represented whether it be in a 2d form on a piece of paper using compass and square or in 3d in the architecture you know of the ancient world and modern the world it's 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 humans trying to replicate existence in a physical manner and and encodes that mathematical those mathematical constants in that geometry and architecture and art to be oh what's the word I'm looking for I guess it's it's the most perfect I guess it could be because like there's nothing more perfect than a universal yeah. constant and so if you want your structure to be perfect then what better way than to replicate existence itself as close as you can that's kind of yes it's kind yeah. of the way I try to frame it in my brain, you know, I get people asking me all the time. It's like, what, you know, what is sacred geometry? And you know, when somebody asks you that, you're like, I don't think you understand how big that question actually is. <laughs> like, yeah. cause there's not, you're never like, you can ask that to a dozen people and every single one of them, we're going to give you a different answer every time. Yes. So, um, it's just, it's, it's, it's really what you make it out to be, but there is a purpose and meaning for it. And I feel like, Maybe at one point humanity knew what it was, hopefully, and we are still we are just trying to figure out what they knew, because you don't just you don't just build a pyramid just to build a pyramid and encode all that in there. Go through all of that, you know, planning and struggle and sweat and blood and who knows what else to do that unless there was a bigger reason and purpose for it. And I feel like we're we're just trying to just trying to grasp at straws to figure out what was that driving motivation for them to do that. And that's yeah. one of those questions that I don't know if we're ever going to actually know the answer to, unfortunately. But if for those skeptics, I, I don't know, uh, well, people are a little bit you know, dubious on it. I think just the word sacred in there scares off a lot of people yeah. and, and, and bring up imagery that's not there. So I, I like to, I, sort of described it a few times it's really about the the geometry of sacred spaces would be an, uh, another way to approach it so whether it's the periods or temples you know mosques and cathedrals you'll see that this uh, methodology you know has been you know re- repeated and even if you don't lean that way at least to you know see the impact that it's had on our you know architectural city plans you know that it it has had an effect on your life, mm-hmm. <clears throat> on your life, whether you sort of you know you realise it or not. Mm-hmm. And but the, the the key part I think is the geometry of it, uh, and 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 the one and a bit like with it, all alchemists had different spiritual outlooks, but all of them were practicing chemistry and mm-hmm. everything which is you know defined within the orbit of sacred geometry. Well, they had different. Uh, uh, opinions of what sacred was right but they're all practicing geometry and 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 just like that everyone's sort of drawn back to the architecture so that right. they're, they're things you can study you can measure and you can look at and you can observe and if you begin and to study is, it yeah and the great thing that i've learned if you begin to study it you know the architecture and the geometry itself the amount of things that you learn that stick in your brain 
Like, you know, if you go through just basic geometry in high school, it is one of the most boring experiences of your entire life. Exactly. Yeah. But if they would just sprinkle in the ancient knowledge that's been passed down for thousands of years into their lessons to where you can like connect like, Oh my gosh, this isn't, this isn't just some random exercise we're doing. This is something that has been used yes. over and over again for thousands of years to not only create buildings, but art and just basically everything. And, uh, it, 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 it sparks the curiosity in your brain and it, it, and I feel like it, it allows you to grasp that knowledge better to be able to remember it. I mean, because before, like, researching this stuff, I didn't know what the circumference of the planet was. I didn't know the polar diameter of the moon. I didn't know what the polar diameter of the sun was or the distance to one another. Yes. And now these are numbers. I mean, I didn't know pi, the golden ratio, or anything, the the length of an Egyptian royal cubit. Yeah. And now these, these are all numbers that I can just, off the top of my head, just spout out there to, to tell somebody. And it's it's just it's just awesome. I, I, I can't... I, I love it. I can't encourage it enough to research this kind of stuff and, and learn for it yourself. Because once you do, it opens up this whole world of like wonder and curiosity, especially within the ancient world that, you know, people have, but they don't understand, I feel. Yeah. And so. I couldn't agree with you, agree with you more in that it got me into yeah, geometry. It's, I come out of, I was very interested in science, but I come out of high school, uh, I, I couldn't, I didn't know anything. Yeah. You know, like I, I passed it, I passed all the tests, but I really, if someone said, well, what's this, what's that? Well, yeah, I, but I didn't know. Um, I wasn't I, trying to remember that. I yeah. got to remember the next thing now. Yeah. <laughs> right? But it's been, uh, for instance, the uh, cathedrals in Europe, which is one of the main points where the sacred geometry is studied, but though Chartres or Cologne, especially, they were universities and they taught the seven liberal arts, mm -hmm. and especially the quadrivium, which is uh, geometry, music, astronomy, and arithmetic. And there was a, a system of education where uh, mnemonics, I think is, you remember, if you don't, even if music is not your favorite topic, you're trained in music because you, you learn geometry, astronomy, and mm -hmm. arithmetic, and those proportions can be applied to music. You right. might hate astronomy, but you love music. Right. And without meaning to, you'll be you'll learn all these other aspects. That's why I think uh, that our ed modern education system is not only uh, well boring; um, it's it's not really encouraging uh, curiosity yeah. at the very least, mm -hmm. but through methods such as like, I wish I had learned this in, you know, primary school because by the time I would have even got into, you know, high school and then thought about further education, mm -hmm. uh, it's not even just the individual facts. It's the, the way of thinking about connecting things and that, right. you know, um, yeah. now you go, kids are educated. They do a music course, but there's no maths involved and, and, Mm -hmm. these things shouldn't be separated you know? mm -hmm. there should be sort of uh, there's a beauty in the connections and that so now you could go through school, like uh, in high school like, there were courses that I just knew I had to get my best 10 credits and then I would get the best possible mark mm -hmm. and then I did the minimal amount of work in the other ones because you're encouraged to keep things separated right you know? um, yeah but I love this thing. and move the on as that, fast as possible yeah right but the unity of thinking and that it's it's a, a way of approaching things and especially in geom look, geometry requires logic and laws there's no cheating you know in geometry right. as well and that's nothing that I, uh really uh, when i got back i picked up the compass and square and i started drawing again and then i realized if you're artistically minded just by learning some of those basic you know drawing a, a golden um, spiral mm -hmm how it how this is used in artists are using it tv producers movie producers are using it to get mm -hmm. the proportions right so it's not just about the very bland geometry of it it's the application that you can put into life and then you really now i walk down the street and i look at a flower and i really ah look right know, there's, there it is there's a beauty in there Beautiful as well thought. yeah right yeah so what what do you think is something where, where do you think someone should start if they were to dive into this 
you know, obviously that I highly encourage them to dive into your YouTube channel to start really would probably be my best bet. But like, if like, what, what kind of like, is there any content that you recommend somebody who doesn't know anything about this subject to start with? Uh, well, for me, it was the Secrets in Plain Sight by Scott Onstott. Right. It's nearly four hours in length and it, it really covers a lot. Um, mm -hmm. But then the rule, uh, that would be, I think, uh, at least because there'll be some little article, some piece in there that you'll find it or, or an author that he mentions or, you know, an individual researcher. So it will be almost certainly something there that you'll uh, find interesting. But... It's a t difficult question because it'll also be well. What is your particular interest? So, right. if you're music, if you're musically inclined, uh, it would probably be like looking up Pythagorean hammers and then um, moving through, you know, uh, through there. If you're astronomically inclined, it might be a. Uh, it's very hard to say, but for me, it was that, that secrets in plain sight. Uh, he again, he compiles so many, and, it, and he's very, uh, you know, open, open-minded. So he's not. Ex even things which I consider a little bit too fringe in my, my opinion, mm -hmm. but he, he has it all in there. And there'll be some piece in there that will probably, uh, you know, capture your attention. And then just with that one name or that one book, you know, you'll be able to find and, and move in the direction. Um, okay. You know, that, that it's up to you. Awesome. Now, how yeah, about, how about a there's, book? There's slight, yeah. Is there a book that you would recommend to anybody? I just I, I get asked this a lot. Hmm. Um, for me, I think, it, and it, it's uh, Euclid's Elements would be the essential. Um, okay. You know, even if it's just just the first book, just start drawing circles and triangles. Hmm. I think that that's the most important you know, important element you know in there because it, it's yeah geometry is really boring in school, but once you start doing this, you realise that it's is artistic aspect to it, or you can go down the, the more mathematical aspect. Or, uh, but in, in itself, it's a form of meditation, I, right. I, I feel. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And just as you start, start to master that compass, you know, and you get a, good at a bit it. more efficient with yeah. it as well, it's it, there's just something that it does to, you know, to the mind. And then because you have to follow these rules, it encourages logic, but because there's so much you can directions you can go it's also a lot of imagination mm -hmm. um, in there and if anything get out the compass and the straight edge and just you know draw draw something um mm -hmm. you know, put on a in a frame and put it up look and, up tutorials yeah. and how to draw specific shapes and whatnot and you know just just to practice yeah. but once you once you get yeah. to where you're efficient at using the compass it is like from experience i drawing with the compass and square is by far my favorite part just because I'm an artist yeah. myself, I've been drawing my entire life, and you know, I'm. It, it's not. It wasn't until I found really your content that I purchased my own compass and square, and I've been using that in my art and geometry, and <clears throat> it's just been, it's been such a great experience. It's not only like learning the mathematics of that geometry, but also the beauty of it and how its proportions just give you a, a wonderful image of you know, symmetry and, and ratio and complexity. But, uh, Alan, I think we're going to leave it there. Oh, hold on. I, you didn't want me to use your surname. Is that, was that right? Yeah, it's not. A, yeah. Maybe okay. That, uh, okay. No uh, worries. Yeah. The, the info, so. That's okay. Um, also one book again would be the 10 books of architecture by Vitruvius. There's plenty of free, uh, downloads on it. And that includes, all the aspects that are connected to this, but it also goes into ancient technologies and the machines that they used in the old times as well. So there's something in that book as well that will grab people's interest. Um, right, as right. Well, from the practical to the philosophical and and uh, mystical as well, it covers a whole whole range of things as well. That sounds great. All right. Well, SGD, I appreciate you taking the time to uh, chat with me. It's been a great experience, and I hope. To the listeners out there, I hope you dive into his content. He's got a lot. I mean, how many videos do you even have now? I, I, I haven't made through them all yet. I've actually gone through and watched many of them over and over and over again because the amount of information you are able to pack into one video is props to you, man. It, it, it's it's wonderful. So, uh, it's, very good. So, 
I appreciate you guys for watching this video, and I'll catch you guys next time. Later. Have a good one. Bye. So I hope you guys enjoyed that conversation as much as I did. And thank you to SGD, Sacred Geometry Decoded, for making the time to come out and have a conversation with me. Really appreciate it. This is the first really long format discussion or interview I have had besides the ones I've done with Randall Carlson. So there's some bumps in the road here and there, but hopefully this is the first of many more to come. I appreciate you taking the time to watch this video. Please be sure to go check out SGD's content. I'll put the links in the description down below, and I'll see you all next time. Later.